This is uh, the first week of Pathic Lecture 211, which is how outer events reflect self-creation. Um, I'm, I use week one to expound a little bit on the whole thing, and then the other weeks, depending on if I have a specific point to make. So let me start with, um, there is a, a sense. It's not a hard sense. It's not a curriculum issue. But there is a sense within people who study the lectures that there are groups of lectures. There are four groups. The first group is give or take the first 25, more or less. The guy, in the first 25, the guide speaks in large general terms about the cosmos, about cosmology, how this all works together. Uh, who is God? Who are the angels? How does this all work? Who are human beings? Um, especially in the first 20, but to 25 or so. And then give or take between 25 and 30, the guide says, and I don't quote him, but it's in there we're going to make a change. And he makes the most remarkable statement to me at that point. Uh, he says, uh, actually, I'm I'm not the team. I'm the spokesman. I'm the one that puts the words into the medium's head. I represent the spoke. I'm the spokesman for a team and the team makes these decisions. So the guide theoretically is a team, not an individual which is why the guide never took credit, never gave a name, and never said, this is my work. It wasn't his work. Between 30, give or take, and 165, the guide changed, the guide, the team, changed course and began to talk about personal, intimate psychology relative to how we grew up and how we handled things. Images, families, parent transference, uh, main image, uh, mass images uh, until about 165. Between 165 and 200, give or take, he enlarged that theme to mankind. Now there's back and forth in all that. Starting with, give or take, 200, the theme became more spiritual. Now there are only 258 numbered lectures and Ava Paracas died of her second bout of cancer in 1979 after 258. And you can sense to some degree that the guide was talking about moving on, moving forward. And there may be some truth that the guide was talking to Ava more directly than he had in the past, that this was her journey that was about to begin, even though the community didn't know it. That's a guess on my part, but that's the sense we have of the lectures. When I do these, the choosing of the topics, I like to bounce. I like to go early, middle, and late. Now, sometimes I don't, but there can be compelling reasons. <clears throat> so that I, I want a lecture that speaks to something that you experienced in your childhood, something that you know. Then I like to move into the 200s and talk about more general concepts about mankind, humankind, spirit kind and how we all relate together. And then bounce back to the first ones where the guide is beginning the process of talking about a concept that will be expanded later into a half dozen or a dozen lectures. Those are very, very dense and they can be hard to understand. Uh, that initial group can extend to anything under 100. So I generally use the first 100, second 100, the last 58 as a dividing point. So this is Pathic Lecture 211. This is about a very challenging concept that not all of you may be ready for. Outer events reflect self-creation, asks you to believe what is a common Pathwork phrase that says, I create my own reality. Now that is very difficult to believe in. It takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of testing. It takes a lot of self-analysis and observation. You may not be there yet. Uh, I wasn't there when I started. <laughs> I wouldn't have understood this in the least. It, it takes time. 
there's a cosmology in pathwork. Uh, and I, I talk about that rather than conceptual or principles or so forth. There's a system. And it's a system just like the cosmos is a system. Now, when we were young and immature, when we were green, when we were primitive peoples, we still had an understanding of the heavens, more so than we did when we started getting sophisticated. So in a joking way, the um, Stonehenge monument and the solar stuff and the Aztecs and their uh, star charts were hundreds of years ahead of the Europeans. So that when the Europeans got together and they, they had a religious belief that we were the center of the universe, they did, were not keen on the voice that said, we're not the center of the universe. There's a system out there. Patrick agrees with that. We are not the center of the universe. We are one of many planets, many systems, many constructs where there is something to learn. On this particular planet, the guide stresses that we are here because we all need to have a refresher course in duality in dualistic thinking. Um, that outer events reflect self-creation requires that you start thinking about things that can't be proven, and that is dangerous territory. That is a place where all of us have been conned, where we have been lied to, where we have been persuaded or convinced by smooth-talking, passionate people who had a different point of view, who convinced us that something was true that we later found out was not. It is harder to do that with facts than it is with philosophy and attitude, and especially energy. Energy doesn't show up on this planet. Now it's starting to, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're working with energetic waves and spectrums of light and we're, we're working on this, but it's not in the common uh, it's, it's not in our hands. We don't have the equivalent of a Geiger counter where we can say that energy is negative or that energy is positive. We can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. On the other hand, we have one of the most remarkable mechanisms perhaps ever invented, and that is the human body and the human mind and the human spirit where we can detect something before it can ever be proven, where we can sense that something is discrepant, something doesn't fit before we know why, where we can follow intuition instead of instinct, and that gets in the way. Guide talks about instinct and intuition, instinct being the survival mechanism. Now, survival can be sophisticated or simplistic, but it's about survival. Intuition is also about survival. It's about the survival of the spirit of the soul and the development of the soul. So that our souls, that our spirits develop is just as important is that as that we eat. And so instinct is usually triggered by an event, something real. It's also triggered by a sense. So these become mixed up. They're not, it's not a clear thing. Intuition can't be proven. The guide says it's a knowing. The knowing may come to you before the evidence for that knowing is possible. Now, a few weeks ago, I took this space to talk about a bladder issue I had that had to do with the fact that I had a, an accident and I believe what happened is that I had some muscles that were paralyzed by spine damage that wasn't important enough to notice or take care of. Um, and then I had some treatments done that awoke those muscles. Voila, I had my bladder back under better control. Before that happened, I could not easily verbalize what my problem was. I wasn't used to describing things in a certain way. I wasn't aware of the mechanism. So I was guessing and I didn't find a receptive doctor. So they didn't listen. I did find a receptive acupuncturist, alternative medicine. I would like to suggest that the human race has undergone something similar. 
and that is that we at one point we thought the earth was flat simply because we couldn't see the curve and we weren't calculating things the way we do nowadays so a flat earth was a reasonable concept to come up with there are people today who insist that that is still true and that we are deluding ourselves with all this psychoscience and they don't believe the science. They don't believe the so-called evidence. They don't believe the pictures. They are convinced we are living on a flat earth. I want to tread delicately here. There are people who believe that the earth is only 10,000 years old. They have reasons. They have literature that communicates to them that they believe in, that has convinced them that there's only been 10,000 years of passage since the earth was created. And so they throw out the science and the devices that give the readings that tell scientists how we were created. Now, I have been in a, a fit of enthusiasm for the past two or three years about the new space telescopes because they confound us. They give us information that make us go back to the drawing board. That is a huge, I really empathize with the scientists and the educate educators, with everyone, it 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 must be exhausting to have your entire theory of space time continuum uh, thrown out and a new one given to you, and have to redo decades and decades and lifetime of work. But if it's true, it's true. What I'm building here, and I tend to build a case. What I'm building here is the idea that those people who do spiritual searches, who are looking for something that at this point in our history cannot be proven, are the pioneers. They're the adventurers. They're the explorers. And they've got nothing but their own intuition to work with. If you choose to reject that, uh, tendency. If you, if the concepts without proof don't appeal to you, you wouldn't be listening to this video in the first place. However, we can try to listen to these ideas and not be able to go all the way through. So what I'm discovering in my own teaching is that the first thing we need to accept to go further, to flesh out all the details is that there is a benign universe that is not run by an angry boss that we have named God. Uh, one of the things I suggest is that people take their God image and trash it like you take something from your desktop and put it in the trash and substitute it with something that you can, that you aren't afraid of. And the minute you even try to do that, you may discover that there's a place where you like being afraid of God. You like the hierarchy of how you have learned to understand the world. Fair enough. If that makes you happy, then that will be your choice. I'm calling on people to believe that not only there is no overriding God, but that there's a plan that makes us the master of our own destinies, the creators of our own universes. That's going quite a bit beyond a benign universe. But perhaps you can see that if I permit myself to be the creator of my reality, the system had better be airtight. So I wind up teaching a lot of times about the plan of salvation and the spirit world because these are all integral. And I think of it like science because my background is more rational. I used to be a very rational person. Uh, so I, I understand how I got here, how I bridged that shift in thinking patterns. But the net result is you are going to have to believe in your own feedback, your own intuition, your own observations, your how you connect cause and effect. So big intro. Now I'm going to talk for a moment about Patrick Lecture 211. Um, the, um, when I, when I read a lecture, uh, and I get close to saying, I think this is a good idea. I boil it down into four subtopics. If I teach a lecture two or three years later, I may pick a different set of subtopics. The lectures are very rich. 
And there sometimes I just can't cover a lecture. So please always go back to the lecture. I'm only highlighting some things for you to play with, to think about. Um, the week one section is about three stages of consciousness. Now, the guide later goes into the title of Outer Events Reflect Self-Creation. But the first thing I feel that he needed to do was to say, and there's different levels of consciousness. For instance, if you're in stage one, what I'm teaching you right now, would say the guide, you may not be able to learn until you're more in stage three. So the first thing the guide is inviting us by putting this first in the lecture is to explore what stage of consciousness, consciousness we might be in. What are those stages? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to read off so that I don't completely botch this. Um, the um, three stages of consciousness, and I even rewrote them because the guide, bless the guide, is sometimes not crystal clear in uh, summarizing. So he'll say something like, well, first this, and then three paragraphs or three pages, and then second this, and maybe this. And I, I, you have to pull out that there are three levels that he's talking about. So these are my rewrites. Stage one is that all events seem totally disconnected from you. And that would be the starting point. That's what kids think. Um, but... That's not what infants think. That's the interesting part. By the time you're a kid, you're not in charge of the world. You don't make things happen. You just have to react to what's going on. But I mean, eight or nine or 10 year old kids, not infants. So I'll get there in a moment. But stage one would be that all events are totally disconnected from you. You can't make anything happen. You can't stop anything. Stage two is where you easily or more easily, because it's a broad range, see that outer events are a result of your attitudes. This is where you start to have a suspicion that you can affect the world. You just don't understand the mechanism. You don't know quite how this all works. And we all go through that. I know I can influence my clique of friends but I, I'm not saying the right words. That didn't work. I, I, let me try these words. And at some point, either I feel effective in getting my group to do things or ineffective in getting my group to do things. Uh, some people feel more empowered getting things done than others. But people who are don't feel empowered usually find some place where they feel they have meaning. Maybe not when they're 13 or 14, but by the time they're 40 or 50, everybody likes to have meaning and effect on the world, even if they settle for a modest effect on the world. Stage three is when attitudes, actions, intentions, and feelings have all become sufficiently purified, realistic, and productive so that you create mostly positive life experiences. I invite you to see this as a range, meaning that the guide tends to describe when he already talks about threes, trying to get that off the screen right now. Whenever the guide describe, describes threes, it's like describing black, white, and gray. Well, uh, there's no delineation in that. There's a purity to one end or the other, but very, Seldom in nature do you find purity. So it's a range. And as we walk along a path, we, we go through a tremendous number of shades of gray. Uh, so if stage one describes a uh, total disconnect from outer events, stage three describes where you're working with it. Not perfect at it, but working with it. And stage two describes where you're starting to say, wait a minute. There might be something here. So three stages of consciousness. Um, in week two, we're going to go after connecting the dots, the how-to. How do you connect the dots? 
And I use that phrase a lot because that comes from my childhood playing connect the dot puzzles. At some point in games of guessing, you have enough connections or enough clues so that you can make a leap. You can see where you're going. And that would be stage two, where you need to collect this information, but you at some point see where it might be suggesting to you what the connections might be. And sometimes you guess wrong. It's the way it works. Um, week three will be about increasing inner and outer awareness. You need awareness to do this work. You can't shut your eyes and close your ears and expect to be educated about the subtleties of cause and effect. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be handed to you on a silver platter. So this work requires work. It requires a willingness to engage. And it's hard to get there. It's hard to get where you are willing to buy into. That you create your own reality. I struggled with it. I didn't understand how that was possible. It took years. So if you're in that phase, I would like to encourage you not to be discouraged because it would be your, it would be a calling you have to work through these details. I trust your calling. If you don't have a calling, you're not listening, you're not reading lectures, and that's fine. Um, for a number of other reasons, that's not a, a deal breaker. That doesn't change the cosmos. It doesn't change cause and effect. Uh, it does mean that you don't wish to work with Catholic lectures. Or if you do, you're going to be working with the more straightforward psychological Catholic lectures. It's a phase. Um, and week four will be about following the inner movement. Once again, connecting the dots, increasing awareness and following inner movement. You've got to build up your own trust that you're being affected. You're going to have to become sensitive, aware of cause and effect. You're going to have to test. You're going to have to rely on something and have it fall apart. And then backtrack and figure out how you came to that conclusion, how you came to that wrong conclusion. From my perspective, that's how the human race got where, where it is. Bridge builders did not build perfect bridges overnight. They built bad bridges at first and they fell in the water or they didn't fall in the water until the larger carts started crossing and they fell in the water. We don't know, this wasn't written down. We don't get history on this. People tend to hide their mistakes. They're not proud of having to build 10 bridges to get one that worked. And they're not always willing to share credit on why that one bridge worked. So sometimes the person who figured it out gets no credit whatsoever never makes it to the history books. The Lord who financed it gets his name on the bridge uh, and gets the credit. Uh, so that's where we're headed with Patrick Lecture 211. Uh, again, the introduction of three stages of consciousness. Um, I, I can't convince you of this. I would not wish to convince you. I leave it to you. Now, in the start of this where, where I read it, there was a phrase that said realistic, but you need to be realistic. There is a place where if you want to disprove something, one of the best ways to do it is to exaggerate or use hyperbole, to use all or nothing, uh, to demand results ahead of time. And so part of the self-awareness that is required to work with this material is to stop demanding, to stop demanding answers, results, proof. To stop saying, well, I don't feel good about this. When I feel good, I will live, I will live with it. I will think this way. I will agree. You may never feel completely good about it. Um, I usually use examples from myself. I don't have one at the moment, but I don't necessarily know where I'm going from moment to moment. I don't even necessarily know what I'm going to say. I am one of those people that doesn't memorize well. Uh, I make very, very rough outlines and trust to my knowledge of the materials. Uh, the outlines keep me uh, grounded and centered so I don't fly off the handle and start teaching some other lecture 
when I'm supposed to be uh, supporting this one. Um, and that took a while. It, it, it took a while for me to feel grounded enough in the concepts where I don't need uh, it written down and I don't need to go through line after line after line where I didn't feel I needed to explain to people how I got to certain conclusions. And yet my use of examples is intended to dis demonstrate that I don't come up with this willy-nilly. I test. I'm constantly testing. There is a difference between testing the connection between cause and effect and demanding certainty. I do not have certainty is what I was trying to say. But I have a reasonable history of having connected cause and effect so that I am willing to suspend judgment and believe that outer events are my self-creation, meaning this, and I'll, this is my personal way of looking at it. You would have your own. I have come to the conclusion that the universe is so big that, that the illusion of life on the planet is so varied that I can from my perspective, believe that I create. And the illusion will allow me to believe that. Uh, sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. And then expect me to respond to feedback as to determine whether that's a correct assumption or not. Now, this is how kids grow up. So I'm gonna bring in now uh, what I referred to from the infant. There is a phase of infant development where it does not comprehend that it is separate from everything. It doesn't know why the lights go off, but it presumes it's responsible for that. And once it gains knowledge, it will be able to turn the lights off and on or make the sun go up and down. It doesn't understand that mother is separate. It just knows it has to make sound and the comfort of mother or father or caretaker appears. And the baby doesn't come up with this idea of, I have to call her from the other room because she's making dinner. It does not understand that world. To some extent, Patrick is taking me back to that infant state. It's allowing me to think that we are all connected and all I have to do is understand the mechanisms that other people are working under and find a way to correlate to that mechanism. And I can help shift communication. I can help shift perception. Now, if I misjudge that, and I think I can affect someone when they don't want to be affected, then I need to let go. Not because I can't affect, but that it takes time and energy that I don't have. So to some extent, what I learned, and I've mentioned this before, is my personal codependence, which brought me to uh, uh, spiritual work in the first place. Codependence is about believing that you can connect with others at all times and affect others, and you can keep your hands on the heartbeat. I find it kind of funny that 35 years later, I'm uh, looking at how I'm teaching the same thing, that we can be connected, we can hold on to the heartbeat of everyone, but in a different way. Before, as a codependent, I did that to make myself safe, to give me the feeling of belonging, of mattering. Now I understand it in terms of I do matter, and I do feel, and I have my task, you have yours. And sometimes they're not meant to intersect and to not try to force intersections that aren't uh, in the highest good of both parties to let go. So a bit lengthy this time. Uh, thank you for listening. If you've gotten this far, uh, Patrick Lecture 211, Outer Events Reflect Self-Creation. It's quite a mouthful and it's quite a thought process. So. We'll go back to the group now.